Good morning, everyone. If you've just joined us, then welcome. Our online event will start in about 10 minutes. We are still waiting for more participants, but feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box in the meantime. Tell us your name and what organizations you are from. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. If you're just joining us, then you're very welcome. Our online event will start in three minutes. In the meantime, please introduce yourself in the chat box. Tell us your name and what organizations you're from. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If you've just joined us, you're welcome. Our online event will start in just one minute. While you wait, please introduce yourself, give us your name and the organization where you're from in the chat box below. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is now 11 a.m. Philippine Standard Time. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is the first part of our two-part webinar series on scaling out climate smart agriculture via climate smart villages. Uh, we'll be covering the lessons and good practices learned in Southeast Asia. My name is Tiffany Talsma. I'm the climate strategy specialist at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture or SEAT. In today's session, we will be joined by speakers who have done significant work in promoting climate smart villages or CSVs as an approach to build the adaptive capacities of rural communities in Asia. But before that, let's have a quick orientation around our Zoom platform that we're using today. In your app, you will see down below uh, the chat button if you don't see it, hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen. That's where we would encourage you uh, to introduce yourself, your organization, and share any insights that you have around the topics today. What you put into the chat will be visible by panelists as well as the audience members in our webinar today. There's also a Q&A button. This is to interact with the webinar hosts. Post your questions here and our resource persons will respond to them. Questions will also be selected to answer live by our panelists uh, later in the session. The objective of today's session is to look at the experiences and the emerging lessons of scaling CSVs, specifically in Southeast Asia. 
To formally kick us off, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Marco Rondon, Program Officer of IDRC, for a welcome message. Good morning, Marco. Uh, good morning, um, Tiffany. Good morning uh, to all. I'm not sure if you are uh, seeing my video. Looks like I'm having some difficulties, but okay, now you get it. So, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, to all of uh, all of you for having uh, accepting this invitation uh, for this important event uh, today. Um, uh, I see that uh, we have participants from quite a wide range of uh, countries, uh, time zones, and um, I uh, want to acknowledge that it's uh, late for some of you, early for some others. So uh, I, I, again, uh, want to thank you for uh, taking the time and the in interest in, in attending this uh, important uh, event. Um, it's, it's an event that, uh, uh, we, on behalf of the International Development Research Center of Canada, uh, have a particular interest in, in supporting um, because it's, a, it's an activity around which we, we have uh, provided support over the years, uh, some of that in the Asia and Southeast Asia region in particular, but also in other parts of the world. And we are uh, especially eager to learn from lessons coming from uh, different corners of the world <clears throat> and <clears throat> lessons that we will uh, uh, incorporate into our uh, program in the years to come. This seminar is uh, very timely, uh, timely because uh, after uh, 10 years of working on uh, climate smart agriculture and in several years using the uh, climate village approach as a, as, a, as a strategy to deploying these uh, innovations, uh, there is already a, a body of knowledge that has been generated uh, in different parts of the world. And it's uh, probably the right time to start synthesizing these, uh, what we have learned, uh, what uh, we still uh, need to, to understand better. But most importantly, we, we have learned that there are um, that there is great potential on the climate smart agriculture uh, approach to uh, not only improve uh, the productivity of uh, foods around the world, but uh, most importantly, improve the livelihoods of uh, farmers who are dedicated to food production. And in the process, also uh, obtain benefits in terms of uh, improving um, nutrition of families uh, and uh, improving the gender balances that uh, usually are not uh, properly addressed in, in a rural context. Uh, the CSA uh, approach is, is an is a interesting and dynamic tool that allows us to make progress in all those dimensions. In that regard, we consider this to be a really holistic approach to uh, livelihoods. And we have learned that um, there, is a, there are ample opportunities to use this for the benefit of communities. Uh, but there are barriers too, um, and uh, and unless we understand well which are those barriers and how we can address those, um, there are only so much that we can that we can move the CSA approach uh, in in different geographical and cultural settings. Uh, this uh, seminar today will provide some of the some lights into what we know so far on this, uh, what we still do not know, and how to move forward. Um, the seminar comes also at a at a significant time in this international context, because um, with the new administration in the U.S. Uh, taking uh, seat tomorrow. Um, an administration that has promised to uh, bring to the forefront of uh, policy and uh, interventions the climate change agenda. We all are very hopeful that there will be more resources uh, and more opportunities to uh, make significant progress in various dimensions of uh, climate change. And in this uh, regard, the uh, uh, climate smart agriculture is, is, a, is a particular uh, uh, is of particular interest to many governments, agencies, uh, etc. So 
uh, I think this seminar really comes uh, very timely, and I congratulate the organizers for uh, for uh, making this happen. Happening uh, for us at IDRC, uh, we are launching just this year a new 10-year strategic plan, and one of our uh, core programs will be around climate uh, resilient food systems. So the climate smart agriculture and the CSV uh, comes very handily because it coincides uh, perfectly with some of our objectives and goals. And then uh, we are definitely very eager to learn from what you uh, have to, to show us and, uh, and um, we, will, we will look for opportunities to continue this collaboration in the, in the years to come. Um, I do not want to take uh, too much more time, but uh, thank you uh, once again for uh, uh, participating in this uh, in this uh, event and providing your insights and, and your your knowledge. We sincerely appreciate that. Thank you very much, and I go back to you, Tiffany. Wonderful. Thanks, Marco. Uh, thanks very much for also inspiring us to get together this morning and. Now I'll start calling on some of our first speakers. Uh, kicking us off this morning is Dr. Julian Gonzalez, the Senior Advisor for Asia Programs at the International Institute of Rural Reconstruction in the Philippines. He has 35 years of experience developing and managing international rural and agriculture research and development programs. He is involved in CCAF's initiatives to promote CSA approaches and associated capacity development in Southeast Asia. He has developed numerous source materials on CSA that have been widely distributed in the region, uh, but I would argue actually globally. Uh, good morning, Julian, welcome. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I am waiting to see my video, but in the meanwhile, uh, my, my uh, presentation in the meanwhile, let me say this. I am going to uh, use a rather uh, general uh, presentation of CSA and CSVs, knowing that we have a wide uh, audience uh, here. Okay, next. So uh, I would not want to make an assumption that everybody knows what uh, climate smart uh, villages uh, are and but i would like to assume that people understand climate smart agriculture to be environmentally sound uh, sustainable agriculture that factors in uh, climate variability so sometimes people use the word climate smart agriculture and sometimes they use the word climate resilient agriculture Next. So uh, we do think that you need climate smart villages or these platforms for different conditions, different ecologies, and even different socio-cultural contexts. Next. So, but climate smart agriculture does not have to be a, a dramatically new idea. It can feature existing practices like here in Cavite in the Philippines. We actually already have agroforestry systems that have been around for 30 to 50 years. Uh, they are climate smart because they mitigate uh, climate change, they sequester carbon. They are a way of adaptation. Uh, the pineapple is a highly adapted crop. Next. So, uh, but we do need to deal with the tension uh, between addressing livelihood needs and the issues of uh, research and development organizations. Sometimes the agendas don't quite match. Uh, you have a mandate, you've been asked to do something, the people want something else. I don't want to say something about this picture because it is a favorite picture of mine. Uh, at the back, you can find 25 varieties of sweet potato in copies for those of you in the Philippines in Ivisan in our climate smart village. Uh, the people are testing uh, what's the best in a coastal environment. And here they're measuring uh, impact uh, of the and the yields of different products. And I, I will fast forward the story and tell you 
uh, out of those number of varieties that were tested, they are now only growing a few uh, and they are adding value to it. So it, it's something that uh, in climate smart agriculture, you do not know what direction it takes place, but certainly livelihood is an important consideration. Next. So, uh, you know, there are many entry points for climate smart agriculture and uh, you that I, I noticed there are a lot of people here with uh, involved in schools. And so I think that uh, you can also have a climate smart school, you can have a climate smart homestead, you can have a climate smart village. So uh, there are different entry points, there are different niches. Uh, next. So, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges we all have is we intend to showcase uh, rather than mainstream. You have a few farmers here and a few farmers there. And I think this is one challenge that we all have to try to address. It would be better to have uh, 30 farmers uh, pick on one idea than uh, one farmer have 20 ideas. That, that's the basic understanding of scaling. Next. So, uh, but you can't uh, expect climate smart agriculture to be adopted and adapted and scaled unless we make investments. And there has been for some time uh, an assumption that training is all that's needed. And I like to challenge that assumption Training is absolutely crucial, but it is not enough. We've got to put the, our money down and uh, where, we, where we want it to happen. And I'm so happy to say, at least for the Filipinos uh, and the audience, that in the last uh, one and a half year, you've never seen so much of investment as by the Department of Agriculture in remote areas, in the municipalities, in the provinces, with small mechanizations and inputs. That's the way to promote uh, widely. You've got to put uh, seeds, money down into seeds, small mechanization, et cetera. So beyond, but including training. Next. So uh, one uh, extremely important part that I would like to strongly make a case for, uh, we still have a situation uh, of uh, people that uh, are left behind. And you cannot have a one size model that fits all. So you have to target uh, the poor people. You've got to target female headed households. You've got to target indigenous people and you need different strategies. So I hope as a result of COVID-19, we all know the need for addressing gaps of, between the poor and the rich. Next. So uh, now when it comes to research institutions, there are a few of you that are here from research institution. Uh, the way I look at climate smart villages, it brings the scientists back to the field uh, so that we do modeling, not only in front of our computers, but we also do modeling on the ground with, com with, with communities, with real, uh, real people in a real life setting. Next. So, um, it, which, which is one challenge we all have, that picture here was taken in Laos. Uh, you can see traditional um, orange culture, uh, even before a researcher recognized that. So sometimes it's very important for us to ensure that our approach is not technological uh, centric. Uh, and then if it is technological centric, then wait for the technology to spread before we start uh, uh, featuring scaling. Scaling is something you do once you know if people have accepted the technology. Next. Next. Okay. So uh, in, in scaling, you have to think of sustainability first before you think about scaling. So very often you have efforts that have scaled and not been sustained. So I think this is very important. Uh, so 
and we need to have evidence of scale. That's why nowadays in all our climate smart villages, the most recent one uh, that I, I, I recently posted was in Cambodia. One village, 800 cashew, cashew trees distributed, 30 families, so that you have a certain scale to eventually you can have a business unit uh, evolving out of that. But there are limits to scaling. Not everybody is going to grow native pigs. Not everybody is going to do organic agriculture. So there are limits to scaling. And therefore, we advocate a diverse portfolio of climate smart agriculture. There's always something for somebody in your portfolio of CSA. Next. So uh, there, are, there, there are different processes that you can use here. And I'm not going to elaborate this. At the end of this slideshow, uh, you will find a huge lot of resources that we will share in the chat box uh, right, to, right away, so you can access the links. But I do want to make this point that you've got to do things on the ground. Uh, you've got to have them on scale. That's why we use the word impact area. And, and you've got to uh, have enough scale for it to be noted by those uh, in the other circles that you can see the municipality province. There's got to be vulnerability analysis at the local level. Uh, and as you can see there on the part agenda, you can see something called as a community innovations fund. Uh, this is something that was an adaptation of work done by Prolinova. Uh, and you, you bring some money down to local communities to, for them to decide how they want to use it. In most cases, it's used for seeds and small livestock. Next. I'm getting to the end of my presentation. So, uh, so those, this outscaling cannot be done by NGOs or by research institutions uh, or be by private sector without engaging local governments. And, and, and later on, you will hear a presentation uh, by Director Alice on the work, uh, extraordinary work of AMIA villages in the Philippines. So engagement of government is the way to scale. Thank you. The next, another slide, please. The next slide. So uh, in such situations, the outcomes are not ours. The outcomes belong to the community. The outcome belongs to the government we are contributors to these processes, to these plans of government, which eventually brings to scale. And uh, you can see this uh, again in a number of Southeast Asian countries and uh, notably uh, in the Philippines. Next. So you, we, we need to recognize that capacity strengthening and mentoring are legitimate. So this takes time. That's why my point earlier, you cannot train your way into scaling. You've got to be able to provide that uh, frontline support. And who are the frontliners? The frontliners are the local government, the local technicians and community leaders. That's why uh, without the frontliners in agriculture, you can't achieve the scale. I, I, pre I feel pretty confident about that. Next. So the private sector has a role to play, uh, providing credit, providing mechanization, provided markets. And later on, you will uh, have a, a, a very interesting presentation from Laos on such opportunities are created. I'm now down to my last slide. So uh, that's a point I made earlier, local government, next. Uh, next, Annie. Uh, this model, uh, uh, which will all be available to you later, is to understand vulnerabilities, test the solution, uh, make that as the basis for the scaling, build the social capital, and share it through the knowledge products, which I will be doing in a minute. Next. So those are the knowledge products. There are links. The first one is on uh, for decision makers. Okay, the next slide. 
Uh, this one, if you want to know more about climate smart villages, check that these out. Okay, next. If you want to know more about climate smart agriculture, you can check this. If you want to know more about climate change, you can check that. Then you have the last resource that is a compilation of all these resources. We will share this with you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Julian. Uh, just to remind our participants, I don't see any questions coming in the Q&A box yet, but uh, please use that space to post any questions for the speakers um, and, and we will try to address those uh, in our uh, live Q&A session in, uh, after two more presentations. Um, please don't put questions in the chat. So just emphasize to please put your questions in the Q&A and that's where our resource people will respond in writing and we will choose some questions to have the uh, panelists respond to. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Bui Le Vin uh, from Hanoi, Vietnam, where I also am sitting right now. Um, Vin has worked on agriculture research for development since 2002. From 2015 to 2017, he was a postdoctoral researcher here at SIAT, working on enhancing the adaptive capacity and climate resilience of marginalized groups in Northern Vietnam. In 2017, he founded and led the Climate Resilience Agriculture and Agri-Food Systems Group. This is a research group at the Vietnam National University of Agriculture. Since then, he has raised 600,000 US dollars for five research projects to support CCAFs and uh, related work in Yên Bai province here in Northern Vietnam. Thank you for joining us today, Vin. Good morning. Okay, it seems that we're having a little bit of technical difficulties from uh, Vin's line. So in the meantime, let's, uh, Dr. Julian, if you don't mind answering a couple questions that are coming in on the uh, Q&A and, and okay. uh, let Vin get set up. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, fantastic. Um, we have, a, a very basic 
a question on, on what climate smart agriculture means um, from Tumiar. She says, what is the definition of climate smart agriculture and is there any criteria to say that some areas have done the concept? And a related question from Marianelle is clarifying whether uh, climate smart agriculture means planting vegetables or other plants that can withstand uh, difficult weather conditions. So maybe uh, just a comment from you to, to clarify what it actually is. Yeah, sure. Uh, like I was saying at the very start, uh, there are many definitions of climate smart agriculture and uh, uh, some would say it's environmentally sound uh, agriculture, uh, sustainable agriculture. But one thing that sets it uh, different, it addresses climate risks. That's very important. And you've got to address climate risks by not unnecessarily uh, contributing to carbon. So that's why we, we would not want you to say climate smart agriculture is providing 100% commercial feeds to pigs that would be a high carbon footprint technology. So we reduce our reliance on external inputs, then it can qualify for it to be climate smart agriculture because it's not something that adds to the carbon. I know this sounds complicated, but what I'm trying to say, it should contribute to reducing carbon in the air. Uh, and if you plant trees, you are actually absorbing uh, carbon. So that's sequestration. So for us, if it's food, food, addresses food, it addresses climate risks, it does not contribute, it does no harm, uh, and it can be sustained. It would be climate smart agriculture. So yes, uh, in addition to the next question, if you grow vegetables, uh, when you never grew vegetables, uh, and if you do it in a, a somewhat environmentally sound way, it is climate smart agriculture. And we are trying to get away from the fact that people uh, think of only one commodity. So small livestock, trees, uh, and uh, even aquaculture can be uh, climate smart by reducing the amount of external feed uh, and so on and so forth. So it's not something dramatically new, but keep in mind, it must address climate change. Hope that helps. I hope that answers the question. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, it does look like we have uh, Vin's microphone online, so that's great. Uh, so this will be the final one, and then we can uh, start with uh, Vin's presentation. And the rest of the questions will be addressed in writing by our resource people while we're uh, listening to the other presentation. Uh, here's a, a good question from Ms. Catherine. Are there any ASEAN-wide initiatives or ASEAN regional collaborations on climate smart agriculture uh, that you could recommend to the group today? Uh, Julia? Yeah, yeah um, there are many and uh, we, would, uh, we would try to provide you the links and the information uh, uh, later, my colleague uh, Rene would probably be able to uh, provide a link. So there are efforts in the ASEAN region uh, to uh, support this. And you have uh, institutions like CIRCA uh, and uh, IRA that also have been involved uh, in uh, supporting such initiatives. And CCAFs, of course, is uh, as a regional program uh, which uh, you can hear more about that later when Andy makes a comment. Thank you. Great, thank you. It looks like we're ready to start. Uh, Vin, are you ready on your side? It looks like you have a mic connected now. Good morning, everyone. Great. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry for a technical error. Um, I didn't know why it it, uh, it didn't work. 
Um, but may I share my screen, please? We can see your slides, Ben. Have I already shared my screen? I think the host is sharing them from IIRR side, so we oh, can see the okay. main slide. Yep. Okay, that's 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 fine too. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again. Um, so. Um, it's my pleasure to join the webinar today to share uh, with you the lesson from the Vietnam case uh, within the CCAFS program in 2020. So um, uh, to uh, to join the webinar today, uh, the topic is, is is integrating the climate smart village approach in Vietnam's NTM or the National Target Program on New Rural Development for 2021 and 2030. So. Uh, Julian uh, did a great job, um, uh, actually for me, um, as an, an entry point to to take you to uh, um, another type of work, which is scaling uh, the CSV approach into a national development program in, in Vietnam. Uh, in the next strategy, so I'll be talking uh, briefly about this program in the next few minutes. Next slide, please. Um, so um, the first slide is, uh, is to briefly introduce you um, about the project. So this, this, well, this one project, uh, the CCAFS project, the project number one, uh, focuses on gender sens sens sensitive CSA options trialed and tested in CSVs and business case development for scaling. So this, this, this is the main project um, within the CCAFS program. And, um, and along uh, along with uh, with this main project, um, as you as you uh, uh, heard the introduction of myself earlier, so I'm I'm a lecturer at Vietnam National University of Agriculture, and I I I've been working with with CIAP, uh, for five years now, and um, at VNUA uh, we have like funding opportunities, and I, since I came back uh, to VNUA from CIAP in 2017, and uh, I have uh, brought more projects uh, to support the CCAFS program in Vietnam. So uh, the project two and three, the, the, they are like two major ones. Um, so I collaborate uh, with uh, the Irish partner, the National Talk and the National um, University, no, sorry, the National, no, what was it called? New Galway, the National University in Ireland, Galway. Um, in applying for this uh, Irish aid um, fund to, to support the work of CCAFs in Yenbai. And uh, we also got um, some funding of 50,000 euros this year from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Vietnam in setting up more CSVs in Yenbai province so that we can have a uh, like strong set of evidence um, for CSVs representing and different agroecologies uh, in one province from from there we we would try to uh, synthesize a uh, a good uh, package of evidence for scaling for recommending um, uh, scaling strategy within the, that net, this national um, target program next slide please um, so uh, some brief information about uh, the Vietnam National Target Program on New Rural Development, or NTM. Um, so, um, so in efforts of changing uh, the face of the, um, Vietnam's rural areas, the government of Vietnam started uh, decided to launch this program back in 2010, aiming at improving aspects in rural areas across Vietnam uh, uh, to improve uh, uh, people's livelihoods, um, leveraging socioeconomic infrastructures for development and uh, introducing business, different business models uh, and maintain social equity and uh, improve environment. Um, so that, so, the, there are, so it, the NTM program has actually completed its first strategy or first period of 10 years, 2000, uh, 2010 and 20. Um, uh, 20. So they have done. They have um, done a great, um, a great job. 
right? So over 50% uh, to be correctly, uh, correctly is 57% um, of the, like, of almost 9,000 communes ac across the country have achieved um, the requirements um, for being recognized as NTM communes. But ho um, however, the program has focused mainly on building, uh, building up infrastructure, infrastructures for so, uh, socioeconomic development uh, and, and cultural and uh, so, uh, social equity activities. Um, and it has not focused enough on building capacity for people and rural dwellers in um, adapting and become more resilient to climate impacts. And they have seen, and uh, we actually have seen a lot of um, of impacts uh, caused by climate risks. And so halfway during the, uh, uh, the strategy, they, the Vietnamese government or, or the Ministry of Agriculture decided to um, include um, like capacity building component into its second strategy, which is 2021, 2030, especially uh, giving priority to the most vulnerable ecological zones, including Northern Vietnam, Central Highlands, Mekong River Delta. Next, please. Um, so, uh, so uh, we we have these three. Uh, projects running together in 2020, and the joint projects, uh, uh, the joint objectives were uh, to have more CSVs, like two more CSVs uh, in the second and, and, and third agroecological zone. So from uh, from the map you see um, at, the, at the right hand side, the right hand side is the original CSV, which is Ma CSV, um, and it was successfully uh, established. Um, in 2018, and then in 2020, we uh, set up two more CSVs, uh, one in the middle and one on the left. And um, the second objective was to, to develop a set of guidance and manuals for CSV implementation uh, for provincial and national adoption. So we, we are now finalizing uh, this set of uh, materials. And then the third objective is to recommend the adoption of the CSV model uh, within the NTM program in its uh, coming strategy, actually starting from this year. And next slide, please. So some milestones that, that you are seeing now on the screen, um, I go from uh, right to left. So starting with the original CSV um, on your right hand side, uh, which is my CSV. Um, so we had like four years to uh, set up this CSV, um, the first CSV. So you, you have heard uh, Julian's presentation, and, and the process was was uh, very similar. So uh, when it, it was successfully um, developed or established, the, the, the first CSV, um, we approached the Ministry of Agriculture and I mean, to present the idea to them, and they immediately became interested. So they invited me to uh, a number of um, national NTM workshops, conferences to present the CSV approach and idea. And, and they said uh, that this could be a very good tool for the NTM um, in, in its second strategy, strategy in terms of um, enhancing adaptive capacity and resilience to climate change or climate impacts. And uh, and uh, I was invited to, to a talk show of 30 minutes to talk about CSV approach uh, on television, on national television too. Um, this channel is specialized for, for agriculture and, and NTM program. And, uh, and after the, the 2018, um, together with my, my, my partners, uh, we brought more, more budget, like project two and three, to support the implementation of the CCAFs in its uh, at second phase, 2019-2021, uh, in terms of scaling. Uh, moving back to the left, so with the two projects, uh, new two new projects, we um, established more to the two two more CSVs in a, the other two agro agroecologies of Yen Bai uh, province, um, applying or utilizing exactly the CSV procedure that we successfully uh, introduced in, in the first one 
in the first CSV. And now, uh, 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 as we speak, we have now two CSV, two CSVs uh, successful, successfully established. So we have now a whole uh, complete set of, of CSVs for Yenbai uh, for policy, like scaling recommendations. And next slide, please. And uh, not like we were not only doing, uh, you know, development or like CSV implementation on the ground, but we also collected evidence to um, to write like uh, peer review publications, especially recommending or targeting uh, policy recommendation. So the first two papers you see uh, on the screen, uh, we wrote uh, these two policy recommending papers uh, aiming to, you know, uh, emphasize the, 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 the necessity of the CSV approach in the implementation of, um, of the NTM program. So uh, we hope that, I mean, the first one has been published, it was published already, and the second one uh, will be published in March 2021. And uh, hopefully these two CSV, I'm uh, sorry, two policy papers will, uh, will be put on, on the desk of uh, Minister of Mart or, or people at, at that level uh, that can make uh, policies and hopefully they this will catch their attention um, and interest in uh, bringing the CSD approach into the NTM implementation in a second phase. Next slide, please. Uh, some key points um, for discussion. Um, at the moment, uh, as, I, as, as I know, the NTM program is still finalizing uh, there are 19 criteria for the new for the, the next phase, um, and uh, so far uh, they have. I, I don't see yet uh, any adoption of the CC approach in in their program, but we still have a lot of time because they have 10 years ahead and they they change they they, they, they adjust their plan uh, accordingly uh, every year and every five years, um, and we need to develop a good like evidence base of CSV. Uh, for scaling at the provincial level and national level as well. And then we need uh, like minimal guidelines for CSV implementation, which we are now finalizing. So we have finished the Vietnamese version and I need to revise it and then we will translate it into English as well. And then we published uh, the work. And then we need to write more scientific uh, publications, technical and policy recommend, recommending so that, uh, uh, you know, this is another. I, I consider this as another way of communicating our work uh, to like uh, high-level policy-making people. Next slide, please. Some insights and learning. So the uh, the drawing on the left is is a general scaling pathways that uh, uh, that we need to adopt like almost everywhere. Right? We have like vertical scaling uh, through policy making. We have we need evidence from the ground, and then we go uh, to high levels like, like for example, uh, community, district, province, and then the country. But then um, at local levels like com uh, community and district, then the horizontal scaling uh, needs to have to happen. Um, so it, it ha this has been scientifically proven by publications. And the drawing on on the right hand side is the um, um, is our work, so we develop this um, diagram uh, to recommend like multi-level uh, coordination and uh, cooperation in terms of uh, integrating the NTM, I know the um, the CSD approach into the implementation of NTM uh, towards uh, climate adaptation and resilience. Uh, so we, as you can see here, it, it requires um, like very tight collaboration, cooperation, coordination uh, among different levels, all the way from from the ministry um, to the community uh, to local uh, the uh, grassroots levels, and then all the way up. So I think I, I would need ten more minutes to explain this this drawing. So maybe uh, we can skip this for now. Um, I can share with you the full translation of the um, publication uh, if you are interested. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some challenges. So uh, the biggest challenge in terms of CSV adaptation and scaling is that uh, we need 
we need uh, policy uh, coming from from the government, from the Ministry of Agriculture, so that the CSD work can be widely uh, implemented on the ground level. So this is the biggest uh, challenge. And up until now, we don't have this policy yet. And two major uh, points for discussion is that um, uh, it, it comes from, from, from my own experience working uh, in the CSVs you know, uh, over the past, past five years. Uh, it's not easy to get full commitment from, from local authorities um, in terms of uh, like receiving the CSV model and then scaling out scaling you know into the um, boundary this this is because uh, partly because of the uh, the challenge uh, that that I presented above like there's no policy for this and then the CSV approach itself uh, especially specifically from from the Vietnam side that it, it lacks sufficient focus on general roles and and uh, we didn't really like uh, focus enough on on strength, strengthening or leveraging social commitment, um, maybe this is like there's a, there was a lack of like uh, expertise uh, in terms of these aspects in, in the team. So, for example, uh, we need um, we need to like um, encourage farmers to 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 come to a common agreement of climate action and CSV or CSA plans that everyone agrees and. And and follows right. So I think in terms of this, I mean to make it more sustainable at the ground level, we, we need uh, full commitment of, of of people from different uh, you know ages and genders and uh, social uh, social status. Uh, um, status. Uh, last slide, please. So uh, in 2021, um, we are keen on fun, uh, finalizing the uh, Vietnamese specific set of CSV implementation materials, which I uh, have talked about several times earlier. Uh, so hopefully the NTM program will, will uh, like consider, it, uh, consider this set of materials seriously and uh, you know, flexibly adopt, adopt them into uh, their program. And um, for, for the project, uh, we need uh, we need to, as I said earlier in the previous slide, that the gender work has not been focused enough over the past year. So maybe this is the, the final year. So we need more budget to uh, to work on this to fully understand how gender's role, how gender roles have played in sustaining the the CSP work on the ground. And then the last point is that uh, we need to more proactively. Um, you know, uh, approach MART and NTM program uh, to to you know, to show them the work they have done and to give them um, our I mean evidence and materials um, so that they um, they will consider the adoption. Uh, according to me, papers publications uh, are necessary but not enough, and we have to physically approach them. Uh, sometimes somehow disturb them a bit, uh, which I I was trying to do, and uh, I will be doing this too. So like contacting them, calling and forcing for for meetings, for example. And it it worked before, and hopefully it will work. Uh, it, it's going to work this year. Thank you. Back to you, Tiffany. Great. Thank you so much, Vin, and. Uh, that really generated quite a lot of interest in our uh, Q&A chat. Um, but before we go into questions for the panelists, um, we'll have our uh, reactor who is patiently waiting to be able to go to sleep, uh, Dr. <laughs> Andrew Jarvis, who is the Associate Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT is uh, based in Colombia, so it's almost midnight his time. Um, he's joining us today uh, because he was a, a core part of establishing the CGIAR um, CCAFS uh, program and a big part of the CSV flagship, and uh, now also set up the CGIAR platform on big data in agriculture, uh, which makes agricultural development faster and more efficient 
through ICTs and big data approaches. ICTs are information communication technologies. For over 20 years now, his research has focused on data-driven policy analysis, on agrobiodiversity conservation, climate impacts, and on adaptation. So thanks very much, Andy, for bearing with us uh, to this hour and welcome. Thanks a lot, Tiffany. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be uh, taking part in this webinar. And um, it's nice to reconnect with, with kind of old friends and, and, and hear on progress of what's going on uh, in these climate smart villages. So, so, so really, really appreciated uh, seeing that progress. Um, you know, this, the, these, the climate smart villages, we came up with this idea um, I guess what eight, eight, nine years, even ten years ago. Um, you know, as as creating these kind of sites where we we concentrate effort and try and, and look to evaluate a whole range of different options um, uh, with farmers, get their feedback, very much action research oriented. Um, and I must say, you know, it's it, almost 10 years on, it's, it's stood the test of time, um, I feel. Um, you know, we have, you know, first of all, is the, the demand for this is, is, is tremendous, right? The, the challenge that we have around the corner with climate change is immense. Um, the options on the table are, um, well, there's many, many options, but the degree to which they're gonna build the resilience or reduce the emissions from agriculture that we need at the, to, to meet the scale of the problem. It's questionable whether we have enough there. And there remain huge evidence gaps of you know, these hundreds of different practices and technologies that we could use and huge evidence gaps in terms of their real contribution in terms of building resilience, creating adaptation in, um, in farming systems for livelihoods and in reducing emissions. And so, so you know, those, those evidence gaps remains we need to fill those and, um, and Climate Smart Villages is a very effective way, um, I believe, of, 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 of filling that evidence gap. You know, one of the things that's really critical, it's very easy to work on an experimental station in the confines of your research organization with a new Climate Smart option, a technology, do the experiment and say, look, this develops, this delivers all of these kinds of benefits. Um, it's not a real world situation. And I think climate smart villages are creating a real world situation for evaluating these kinds of options. It's with farmers, co-developed with them uh, and, um, um, and out there without so much of the kind of the control conditions that we have in research or research um, plots. So that's really important. Um, and then it's co-developed. I think that's, that's also a critical piece of this. The, the, the evaluation the, um, the, the options and the technologies themselves are co-developed with communities. And that, um, uh, that in itself also is, is building a lot of value in, um, in, in the process. Um, it's blending, I think Climate Smart Villages are really blending kind of what I would, what, I, what you could call kind of indigenous knowledge. It's using farmer knowledge, um, but blending that also with an injection from, um, from outside of new ideas and new options and new technologies. And I think that's really um, um, uh, important and novel and doesn't happen enough. It's, uh, uh, you know, and I think cl Climate Smart Village has been real pioneers in doing that. And then, and then it's, you know, the other, the other piece is there's a lot of agricultural research develops a new technology. It could be a new variety. It could be a new practice and, um, and, and promotes it and evaluates it out on farm. But in, again, it's in isolation. It's just doing one thing. What, one thing that the evidence has really shown, and, and, and a lot of the work from Climate Smart Villages has, has been showing this across the world, is that when you put options together, you have much more impact. And so it's not just about a single agricultural practice. It's combining that with other practices, with improved seed, with soil management uh, techniques, and then also linking it up to things like services and programs and policies. And so getting in climate information services in there or weather, for, uh, uh, weather forecasts or, or um, providing insurance, um, um, index-based insurance schemes. All, you put these things together and as a portfolio, it shows how multiple options can work together 
in the real world, in the complex, very messy real world that is out there in, in farmers' fields, and together deliver more um, adaptation and more vindication and more livelihood benefits for farmers when, when, when together rather than in isolation. So that's really been uh, very, very important. Um, what's, what's encouraging to see is, is, is that these kind of climate smart villages are, have become kind of organic and living organisms, um, not only in their sites themselves, um, you know, and, and, and I think the concept has vastly uh, changed over time, um, and each village takes its own path and its own direction. And that's, that's part of, I think, the, the very much part of the, the value of these. Um, but also the kind of the concept of what you're doing is, is, is evolving and changing and, and, and taking different pathways in different regions. So when you go to a climate smart village here in Latin America, there are, we, have, we have climate smart villages in Africa, in, in Asia and in Latin America. You go to one here and it's very different. The, the, the kind of approach and the, the, the way it's being implemented is very different. And I think that rich, that's actually, that's not a problem. I think that's a good thing. That's, that's, that's part of the richness of the process because it is tailored to local needs and listening to um, local, um, uh, local priorities. Um, and I think one of the things that we, the, the other thing that's been interesting is, I mean, from a scaling mechanism, in terms of having impact from these climate smart villages and beyond the climate smart villages, the local buy-in that there is, there's nothing like a farmer promoting uh, a technology or an option. Um, it's much more powerful for a farmer to be talking about that and with their neighbors and word of mouth as a scaling mechanism. Uh, uh, that's often much more powerful than, than having kind of extension systems or, or, or researchers kind of promoting something, you know, I think farmers listen to farmers. And so that's also been something that I think has been, been, been very important. Vin, Vin uh, noted all sorts of kind of challenges that we have. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's part of the course in these kinds of things. Uh, but I would say, you know, on the, on the whole, you know, I mean, listen to progress and, 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 and seen these evolve over the years. I mean, I, I think it's a really, really interesting um, approach that's been validated that continues to fill evidence gaps and continues to contribute to um, to knowledge about how to confront um, in communities how we confront the huge challenge that is climate change and so um, so yeah that, that's those kind of my reflections in in, in listening um, I don't want to eat more time I know we're a little bit late so um, back to you Tiffany great. Thanks, Andy. Um, well, we will let you off the hook <laughs> so that you can get your beauty sleep and really appreciate um, that helpful synthesis of the presentations we had today. Actually, just a question for our hosts. Um, to stay on time, we could move to the next presentation or we could take a couple of questions um, for Vin since he didn't get a chance to answer. What would be your recommendation on how to carry on? Yes, Vin can answer some questions first. Okay, fantastic. Um, so maybe just one, one more for uh, Julian, which should be a quick one. Uh, is climate smart agriculture the same thing as organic farming? For sure, I think you can pass uh, that on as climate smart uh, uh, agriculture. And, uh, 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 for various reasons that you well know. It is one form of climate smart agriculture. It is not the only way to do climate smart agriculture. But certainly it is, um, it is the Cadillac in the different approaches as far as uh, uh, climate smartness is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Vin, uh, we have a question here for you. Can you give us a brief description of the CSP package that was successfully implemented in the province as evidence of scaling? What, what is the actual practice uh, or package that is being scaled out? Uh, hello, Tiffany. Hi. Do you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Yeah, could, could you repeat the question, please? Because I, I, I was encountering a technical 
Sure. It's also much easier for me being able to read the question. So apologies. Okay. Can you okay. give us a brief description of the CSV package that you uh, mentioned was scaled successfully out across Inbai? What What is the technology or practice or what is it that is being scaled? Okay. Could you give us an example? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the CSV approach has not been scaled outside of Myanmar yet. Um, if we only talk about uh, the northern Vietnam, but then uh, when we were um, setting up the first CSV um, in, a, in a period of 2015 to 2018, we managed to introduce some CSA technologies to um, another province of, of Cao Bang, uh, which is like 300 kilo kilometers from Yen Bai. So uh, we sent a team there to train farmers of three districts um, uh, and a number of CSA technologies like um, um, rice straw processing so that uh, I mean, to, to limit the burning of, of rice straw after harvest. Um, waste management, uh, for example, that, that, that is one, one, one technology or practices of, uh, for waste management. Another one was um, vermicom vermicomposting. So we introduced these two, at least two um, CSV, no, sorry, CSA uh, practices there. And, uh, and then uh, it, like oh, two months later, we received uh, a delegation coming from, from, from that province visiting my CSV, so our first CSV. And they came back to respond to what they had learned uh, from us and they wanted to see more uh, from my CSV because uh, it seemed to me that it, it wasn't enough what they learned they had learned from 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 the training uh, team that we sent there um, and then they came to see us uh, to stay a full day with us and then we took them around um, the CSV and they learned they had learned more uh, on that trip and then we had a reflection uh, session afterwards for one hour uh, at the end of the day and and um, the people, they, they were around 30 people, including farmers and uh, extension workers, local authorities. And they said that it was a very good um, model uh, that they wanted to, they, they wanted to uh, apply in their, um, uh, their districts. Um, they, they have learned, uh, they, they learned more from what they had learned from, from a, from a uh, training team earlier um, because they, they could see how a CSV or, or climate village uh, operates, right? So um, that that was a, our very initial success because they approached us for um, for the knowledge. We didn't approach them. We didn't at, at the time we were still implementing CSA practices, and then we didn't we were not ready to scale. But then they they came to us, and then we uh, we sent tra some trainers there, and they, they came to us again, and, and that was our initial success. But uh, again, the, uh, the the biggest challenge is that um, we need the government of Vietnam to release some budget, yeah, uh, or like of uh, um, uh, to allocate some some budget for for CSV implementation and implementation of CSA practices as well. So that's that's the key point. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I guess we'll take one more question for the live Q&A and the rest we will respond to in writing um, as our next speakers come on. So the last one really could be to either of you, Vin or Julian, um, but really related to, to this outscaling. What expectations does your, do your groups have with the scaled up CSVs apart from policy change? Who would like to take that one? Okay, just to, to be able to quickly uh, respond, uh, Vin is welcome to join in. Um, we, we think that, uh, uh, that uh, um, I'm a smart village is a platform that will evolve in the manner that um, uh, Andy mentioned a few minutes ago, 
And so we're talking about uh, an evolution over time. A climate smart village might focus on some problems initially. Over time, it might focus more on marketing. For example, right now we have a lot of fruit tree projects and small livestock. Put the cart before the horse. Uh, we get on the production side uh, and then uh, later on. So I, uh, maybe that's, uh, that's aside from policy influence, it's really unleashing a range of opportunities that farmers have. There is no shortage of it. Local knowledge based solution to scientifically do and blending of the of them all. So uh, the opportunities are determined as a result of the problem analysis and the vulnerability analysis. That's Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you to both of our speakers and also to Andy uh, for responding to these questions and for sharing your experiences with us today. Uh, just to remind the audience, please keep your questions coming. Even those that we do not address in the live Q&A session will be addressed in, in writing. Um, and so there will be someone to answer them if you keep those coming. Uh, let's begin with our next set of speakers. Uh, so Dr. Peter Sprung is joining us as the Climate Smart Agriculture Specialist at the International Rice Research Institute, or IRI, also based in the Philippines. Uh, for two decades, he has been doing interesting work in the field of sustainable agri agriculture, forestry, uh, agriculture, and climate change in Southeast Asia. His work focuses on training and value chain development. Uh, Peter will give us a, a nice uh, case study on uh, market linkages and work with the private sector. This should be interesting and directly address some of the questions that we've seen coming in on uh, working with uh, private sector business models. So thank you, Peter, for joining us this morning. Over to you. morning can you hear me I yes we hear I you loud and clear okay wonderful well um good morning uh, from germany my uh, office in, in los banos is uh, still closed so uh, thank you tiffany and, and my dear colleagues at, at yet and i are for for this opportunity to to join your seminar our seminar um, i I would like to clarify that I'm, I'm not really the uh, agriculture smart uh, climate specialist at Erie. I, uh, all credit should go to my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Rainer Wassmann, who uh, has been leading this project over the last years and uh, he retired uh, last year. So I, I was brought in uh, with my background on, on value chain development. And uh, it's my pleasure to share with you some, some of uh, uh, my thoughts there. So next slide. Um, Andy quite, you know, inspiring uh, mentioned that farmers talk to farmers. So imagine that in, in Laos, you would have a female farmer who you know, talks to fellow farmers that uh, she's getting the same pay as, uh, as her male counter farmers, that she's not only having a higher yield, but she's now also a rice exporter, the first in, in, in the village. So, uh, you know, just, just to imagine what that market linkage could provide as an, as an additional uh, motivation and as an additional uh, reward to, to farmers who, who implement our, our work. Um, and uh, I, I want to give recognition also to um, my colleague, uh, Jerome, who will be uh, speaking in more detail about the project in Laos on the uh, session two on the 27th of, of January. So just that you know, these are, these are two sessions here in this, in this webinar. And obviously not only uh, could this farmer inspire neighboring farmers, it, it would perhaps also 
give uh, uh, some pride to, to local or, or national government that Laos is, is exporting rice. And uh, we've, we've heard in earlier presentations the important role of the government. So what an opportunity then for to scale and uh, as more market demand grows, also to reach the, the quantities that, that some of the market uh, players would uh, eventually demand. Uh, next slide. So here at Erie, my, my colleague um, Matthew de Mon has, has done some, some research that illustrates that consumer practices are changing globally. And uh, so the, that uh, a consumer would demand or be willing to pay a, a higher price for a product that's sustainable, that is uh, traceable, you, you would find that evidence in places like the Mekong in, 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 in Vietnam. As uh, there is a growing number of uh, middle, higher income uh, consumers, these consumers for, have a, um, a choice, a new choice to make. Uh, they're no longer buying perhaps rice at the, the local corner, uh, store, they, they would go to, to a larger supermarket and they are facing uh, different products with, with different labels, with different descriptions. And the, the research that, um, that uh, Matty and others have done shows that uh, consumers in Vietnam, in the Mekong, uh, are willing to pay up to 33% higher uh, for a product that uh, he provides clear information about the sustainable practices, uh, about the quality, and also about the traceability back to the producer. So we, sh we should not uh, think about these, these market uh, incentives, uh, something that's only playing out in, in, you know, in Australia or North America or it's, it, it's happening around the world and, and consumers around the world are concerned about climate change and you will find uh, consumers willing to pay a premium globally. In addition, as my, my colleague uh, um, Bjorn Ole Sander uh, informed me, there are, there are trade agreements, for example, between Vietnam and, uh, and the European Union that could provide uh, you could say almost an, a, a policy requirement for uh, uh, climate smart agriculture to get a market preference. So that is another exciting uh, development that, that more and more uh, policymakers are, are, are taking a look at uh, climate smart agriculture. And uh, I think uh, the climate smart villages have a real opportunity then to use their data, to use their information and um, uh, meet these uh, requirements for, for export and, and international trade. Um, finally, I want to mention uh, again, Dr. Rainer Bassmann, who has been uh, developing a, a new carbon footprint calculation tool. Uh, I can't share too many details about it. It's uh, still being uh, reviewed, the publication, but uh, just let you know that, uh, you know, new, 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 uh, well, it's not really that new, but QR codes and, and new ways of, of, of calculating uh, the carbon footprint will also help the, the marketing of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, rise from uh, climate smart villages on product, and you see a little image there that, that illustrates that. Because consumers, you know, they, 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 they really will, will compare products. So if one product has a, has a better uh, uh, carbon footprint and, and, and it looks just the same in terms of quality, they, they'll probably give it a preference. And, and retailers know that too. Um, next slide. So, I was asked to talk about insights and learnings, and what what I could pick up from my from my colleagues here at Erie is that um, you you have a, a whole opportunity uh, along the uh, um, value chain. So you in post harvest, for example, if you 
if you reduce losses, you can then also uh, calculate that in terms of uh, avoided uh, greenhouse gas emission. And this then opens up a whole new opportunity to, to build on our work in, in, in climate smart villages and, and engage more uh, actors along the value chain and, and bring down the, the total carbon footprint of a product. Because it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a good start to have the, the, the climate smart practices at the village, but you, you actually want to make sure that the, that the whole uh, product is uh, sustainable, transport, all, all kinds of expert, uh, aspects. So um, there, there's, a, there's a real opportunity there to, um, to, to uh, engage more actors and uh, uh, next slide. What what we've uh, seen in, in as we engage with the the private sector is that um, well they first of all they wanted to know about the the product quality and uh, that comes with uh, testing for quality and uh, in Laos it, it was a, a challenge to to find these uh, testing facilities. Um, even my uh, office Erie in Los Manos, due to COVID and other constraints, uh, could not respond uh, at this point of time. So we 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 had to um, really find uh, 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 um, uh, a testing lab uh, uh, outside the country to 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 document residues and uh, contamination. <clears throat> Which is the the precondition for uh, for uh, trade. Um, we've uh, also uh, we also have to recognize that <clears throat> you you want to have a strong farmer group that can uh, negotiate fairly with the with the um, value chain about the the price premium. And, and that takes quite some preparation in, in, in setting up the structure and uh, also managing expectations. And um, include a component that would ensure that, that women also receive uh, an equal pay. Yes, final slide. So in terms of uh, ways forward, we've, we've, we already have uh, one retailer who has shown uh, the excitement about uh, climate smart villages. They, they don't necessarily want a particular standard or a label. They, they just like the, the concept and they are, they are willing to communicate that to their, uh, to their customers. And um, it's now you know, starting small and, and, and providing uh, this, building up this, this value chain in, in this particular case for Laos. Um, but then, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's really no limit in, in, in terms of scaling for for other villages in Laos or uh, in other countries. In fact, it's, it's probably already happening, um, uh, just that it's uh, that I'm not aware of it. Um, then, uh, well, documenting carefully the, the the benefits among stakeholders because uh, that that always is a is a good story to sell to consumers when they see that that farmers are benefiting you know that farmers are getting a, a higher profit a, a better yield um, you know that 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 is uh, that and that needs to be documented carefully and and in the end uh, communicated uh, truthfully as we as we do in in, in this project uh, about the benefits of the CSV approach. And then finally, you, you see the picture on the right provided by Mr. Uh, Ole Bjorn Sanders. We, we, we can work with investors and provide them the data uh, that, that allows them to invest further because the private sector along the value chain, they might not you know, be, they, they, will, they will probably pay a little premium but they 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 cannot uh, you know take the necessary investment to um, uh, upscale some of the projects as as we intend. So 
uh, but hopefully then the, the data can, can, can help us to convince investors to do so. Um, with that, I look forward to your questions and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, We'll have another two presentations before moving over to the questions. So first let's hear about how a modified version of the Climate Smart Village is being promoted in the Philippines. Ma'am Alice Ilaga is the director of the Philippines Department of Agriculture's Climate Resilient Agriculture Office. She is the department's deputy spokesperson and she has 26 years of experience in developing, managing and directing livelihood agriculture financing, biotechnology, climate change, and countryside development programs. Warm welcome to you, Ma'am Alice. Hello, mabuhay to our 257 participants. Thank you for <laughs> staying. It's now lunchtime in the Philippines. <laughs> so this, more, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to present uh, Promoting Adaptation and Mitigation in Agriculture through AMIA Villages in the Philippines. So Amiya, it looks like a, a name of a beautiful woman. <laughs> but in the Philippines and in agriculture, this is Adaptation and Mitigation Initiative in Agriculture. Two things we can do about climate change, to adapt or adjust our system or way of doing things, and mitigate, reduce our carbon greenhouse gas emission. So we know that these are the things that we have to address. So AMIA is our flagship program in addressing climate change. And we envision that the sector would become climate resilient yet progressive through the provision of responsive integrated support services. As an approach, AMIA does not only develop and promote climate resilient agriculture through implementing technologies and practices, but we are introducing institutional and social innovations and uh, facilitating access to relevant support services to the communities. It is our goal to have bountiful harvest and increased incomes for our small and medium and large farmers amid climate change and even the pandemic. So uh, when we started the program, we were asking ourselves, okay, now we're doing some mainstreaming in our policies, our programs, projects, but how do we really build local resilience? So it is good that uh, no, there are already NGOs or CSOs uh, doing or building models or experimenting. So what we did was just to look for these models. And we came across 11 RRs, CSV Village in Ginyangan and Ivisan. And we also look into the, the practices in Rice Watch Action Network's localized climate information services, which is linked to their climate resiliency field schools. We also scouted for other best practices. So we are very good in copying what is best and then implementing it in our AMIA villages, uh, especially where these are applicable. So what is an AMIA village? It is a testing ground for adaptation and mitigation. Um, food security, livelihood, income, and nutrition are important dimensions. Next slide, please. So what are our learn experiences, learnings, and insights in the implementation of AMIA villages? So number one, the villages serve as a platform for innovation and partnerships. Innovation for us in the government in the delivery of support services, like we introduced local climate information service. It's a new thing. 
when you want to address climate risk, you should have a very robust uh, climate information service. So that's an innovation for the Department of Agriculture. Then uh, we need an innovation fund at, as uh, was described by Julian earlier. This is a fund uh, which can give to the communities so they would not be afraid to test the technologies themselves. And third, of course, we were talking about tailor fitted, but in the case of the Philippines, it is integrated support services. It's providing seeds, it's post harvest facilities, linked to credit, linked to market, localized climate information. So this should all support uh, the needs of the community. The second, it is a platform for partnership. As you can see in our logo, uh, can you please go to that slide? It's a partnership among the Department of Agriculture, local government unit, farmers, CSOs, state colleges and universities uh, all together. So the second experience is that organizing, clustering farmers living together or tearing continuous, contiguous land of 100 hectares for economies of scale and wider adoption of CRA is a social innovation. Then the Amelia village, this is a very important learning. It is farmer centric. It is focused on the farmers. Farmers identify their climate risk, the suitable adaptation measures and their needs through community participatory action research. And this is also a method to attain the sustainable development goal on zero poverty in 2030 for the Philippines. So the Amiya village serves as a go-to place or a lighthouse. It is a learning site where farmers are supported to experiment on their CA practices and options and make a choice which CRA technology to adapt because we are supporting them with technology, technological options, and even the options coming from themselves, and then introducing the social and institutional innovations. So AMIA villagers generally experience increased productivity and income contributing to increased adaptive capacity, which is consistent with DA's goal of masaganang ani at mataas na kita amid climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. So another, uh, another point is that the success of the AMIA village approach depends largely on the support of local government units. The Department of Agriculture being a devolved organization has no direct extension work. So the LGUs serve as the conduit for the implementation of projects on the ground. The LGUs are also the champions of the AMIA village approach in preparation of the implementation of Mandana's ruling. This is a ruling in the Philippines and it will be implemented in 2022. Uh, regarding the equitable distribution of local government of local revenues so the lgus will get more money while the national government agencies will get less resources uh, next is adaptation must be done in wide scale to be effective the amia villages now serve as building blocks for scaling up adaptation action. And the last uh, insight, the, the AMIA village is an effective approach to rural development. So these are some testimonials of farmers. Next slide, please. Yes, even during the pandemic, they had food to eat. They were producing for their families and their community, and they have other sources of income. 
their vegetable planting it addresses their daily needs while waiting for the harvest of rice, which will come a long time. So what are the limitations in the implementation of the seed climate smart village approach as described by Julian and Dr. Andy uh, Jarvis? So uh, we did not adopt it lock, stock, and barrel because it was self-reliance focus, which is important as, as, the, as a starting point. But uh, we added the ingredient of uh, enterprise development because the department really focuses on mainstreaming the marginalized farmers and fishers in the value chain. And mind you, the best adaptation um, a measure for farmers is increased income because if they have incomes, higher incomes, they can choose on many uh, climate change adaptation measures. Oh, let me also share what are limitations in the implementation of the EMEA village approach. One, government procurement. Yeah, this is a big problem for us, especially if we want to deliver tailor-fitted support services. It's not that easy to purchase. So we really love the institutionalization of an innovation fund. So for our donors, our partners, I hope you would consider providing innovation fund so that we can upscale climate adaptation. Second is frequent change in leadership both local and national level. So our solution here is uh, climate resilient agriculture plans should be included in the LCCAP. When we say LCCAP, local climate change action plan. In the Philippines, we have a law which uh, mandates our local government units to develop these LCCAPs. And our CRA should have different time scales short, medium, and long-term plans. So if there is a change in uh, the leadership in the local government units, you know, the CRA plans are already inscribed in the LCCOP. Fourth is institutionalization of AMIA organization at national and regional levels. Right now, our organization still ad hoc, but there has been a directive from the Secretary of Agriculture to institutionalize AMIA through the Climate Resilient Agriculture Office. But we are recommending that the, the regional AMIA offices be institutionalized likewise. And the third, the last limitation would be, of course, the integration of the AMIA village approach and even the tools to our national banner programs and the farm and fisheries clustering and consolidation programs. So these are our national programs which have very big, 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 big budget. So how, how do we get the buy-ins of this program so that they adapt the AMIA village approach or they adapt the AMIA villages for scaling up and expansion? Ways forward. So we're moving AMIA Village to AMIA Create. AMIA Create, Create here means climate resilient agriculture fishery techno based enterprise. So from livelihood, we're now moving them to an enterprise level. Currently, we have 77 AMIA villages in 33 provinces, we have 81 provinces. So we want to target uh, the presence of AMIA in all provinces because we have one in each region already. And we want to scale up from village level to towns and provinces. And we like to transform the organized groups into climate resilient business enterprises. This is very much consistent with the challenge of the secretary. Uh, 
he said that you have to upscale this program in a big way, expand it nationwide. AMIA's application should be bigger and wider. And finally, I like to end my presentation with a quote from the secretary himself. The new agriculture is climate resilient agriculture. That's why he created a new office. That's my office. And he named it himself, DA Climate Resilient Agriculture Office. So thank you very much for listening. And we have a web page and you can contact us through these numbers. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Alice, for that uh, presentation. And uh, we also have some questions coming in for you on the Q&A already, so quite a lot of interest. Our final presenter today is Sorapong Pasamsuk, Program Policy Officer for the World Food Program, uh, or the WFP in Laos. For almost seven years now, he has been managing the food security, climate change, and resilience recovery and livelihood program uh, for WFP in Laos. And one of his projects involves setting up CSVs and linking them with school meals and nutrition programs. Uh, with Sorapong today is Dale Wilson, also from the World Food Program. He'll support in responding to questions as needed. So welcome to you both, uh, Dale and Sorapong. Good morning, everyone. We can hear you uh, loud and clear. Yeah, okay. You can see me or oh, no? Not yet. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, good morning again, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to present uh, about our lesson learned on CSB in Laos. Uh, in Laos, we uh, we consider that uh, this is quite a new initiative for for WP uh, in implementing the CSB in our target area with the technical support of the uh, IIR from the Philippines. We consider that it is as uh, the two years pilot project in the countries covering uh, last year 2020 and this year 2021, and the overall. Objective of this is to integrate uh, agricultural practice uh, into our school, school feeding program, which is uh, one of our main key uh, intervention in Laos. We are implementing this uh, school feeding program in almost uh, 1,000 schools in the countries, which is covering around maybe one third of the total primary school. Next. Uh, for this uh, CSV project, uh, we, as I mentioned, we would like to integrate this uh, agricultural climate change adaptation strategy into a uh, nutrition focus program in, in Laos uh, with the four key project components. First is about we would like to test or piloting this uh, CSV as a learning option for gardening and, and with uh, participatory action research and social learning approach. And the second one, we uh, want to develop a community support mechanism so that we can operate this uh, activity in the, in the ground more uh, effective in the future. And we set to facilitate the adaptation planning platform for this CSV, CSA in, in the countries. As well as the, the last uh, component of this project, we expect that this set of experience and knowledge will be shared with other development partners or local government in the countries where, where we can uh, adapt this across in the wider areas. Next. Uh, the key milestone of our CSV project in Laos. Uh, they uh, include the uh, understanding or uh, doing the assessment of 
our target area where we can see the, the actual context of the local area and, and lead to develop the, the way we work with the community, including the gardening that fit to local context. We de develop uh, the knowledge and That's produce the CS, CSA option. Uh, so far, we, we start as the pilot project. We start in five CSB projects in, uh, in Pongsali province. Uh, under this uh, intervention, we are trying to develop the development approach where we can contribute or provide the support for the community so that they can start this uh, new approach in their agricultural practices. And the other key milestone we expect to be happening in the future is about sharing our experience and lesson by organizing a different level of uh, events at national level or sub-national level so that we can uh, uh, work with other development partners as well as the government to, to, to extend this CSV approach. Next. Uh, after one year action in the countries with uh, the technical, uh, I would say the remote technical support from the IIR team, we also have some uh, lesson learned from, from our uh, project. The first one is about the understanding about the communities where we target to uh, understand about how they live, how they work. On, on the ground level, it's very important to identify the context of our CSV or CSA option, where we understand that uh, different location might have the different uh, CSV option for coping uh, uh, on, on, on the livelihood approach. Uh, like uh, in the first step of this project, we uh, conduct uh, the first scoping mission we could identify different activity in, even in different villages in the same district or different uh, province. They are not far from each other, but the action to be taken on this is somehow different. Uh, we learned that the CSV approach needs big of investment time human resource to support the various activity on the ground. As you uh, know that uh, this is uh, the new initiative for us, we might need dedicated staff to work on this so that we can provide better support to the communities. Uh, we also understand that the diversification of livelihood and improve access to food security, improve livelihood, resilience, and likely to be benefit to household uh, securities. Uh, Another lesson is about, we, we learned that we should work more to promote the CSV and CSA approach so that the local community really uh, increase their acceptance and, and adopt this approach. You know, uh, having said that uh, the communities, farmers are not, uh, not start from the zero, let's say they have their own practice, they have their own indigenous knowledge. And then to promote CSV and CSA, somehow we need to look at what they are doing now and then adapt on the way that they bring uh, the interest for them too. And one of the most important future goal for us is to uh, make sure that CSV approach need to be integrated into the law development plan and uh, ensure that the sustainability of that approach in, in the local area as well. Uh, next. We have some uh, limited uh, factors of challenge in, in implementing this uh, CSV project in, in Laos. Uh, it's like a identification of the market chain <clears throat> to realize the technology and investment decision for farmers to adopt this CSV uh, uh, option. We, we need to work more 
to make sure that the farmer really get that uh, important and invest for their, their practice. Uh, in terms of the, <coughs> oh, sorry. In terms of the uh, technical support and expertise from, let's say from outside like uh, WP or government, this must be made available uh, at, at a certain level. I mean, this quite a lot of work for us to, to work with the community and make sure that we transfer the effective notice and, and, and bring the, the change to the community and beneficiaries. Uh, the other challenge uh, we, we see is that to measure the impact of this approach in terms of food security and nutrition aspect, somehow it's still a bit too early, I would say, for us to measure that it's like as the beginning of, the phase, of this phase of CSV, we still not clear to measure impact of, of this uh, food and nutrition security it might need more action for us and more time to generate the, the impacts. Uh, the other limitation for us is about the, what we call the uh, creating the CSV as a platform for others, villagers or communities to learn from. Where we, we work are quite remote and limited access for all year round and many of them are only accessible in uh, dry season only. So when we have this in place, it, it doesn't mean that all the time are available for us to, to, to learn from those target communities. Although we have a good uh, result to learn from the CSV, but we need to see how we, how we select the target area and how we set up the learning platform for, for those who are interested in Okay, next. And uh, my presentation is uh, uh, almost finished. And uh, the last one is about the way forward in uh, this year, 2021. Uh, in the current target areas, we, we will continue to sustain and scale up the, uh, the current activities in, in the target area with the target household, like a community garden, school garden, uh, co forestry, uh, local variety seed collection, or uh, native chicken or pig grazing, something like that. That's on our uh, plan, and, and we, we plan to continue this so that we can improve or increase a better impact for school meal and nutrition program. Uh, we plan to introduce the climate information and service to farmers where we think that the climate information would help farmers to have a better planning for crop or food productions. We have uh, some experience on this project from a uh, partnership with AFO in the south of the countries. And we, we will see how we can adapt that tool and then apply into these, these three uh, target areas. And the other one is about the mainstreaming uh, the CSV approach into the local government development plan, as well as uh, promoting the engagement of other development in, in the countries or in the same area to apply this uh, approach. So this means that uh, not only WP, we, we hope when we are clear or when we have the good results uh, generated and then we do hope that the government will take this into consideration and as, as part of the agricultural promotion plan in the future. Okay, uh, this is the end of my present presentation and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, maybe for the IAR team in the Philippines, as we are joining hands to implement this project, you are welcome to contribute any information to my presentation in case I have missed some. And uh, for one participant, uh, if you are interested in our works in Laos, uh, you are welcome to uh, contact us at any time. Uh, we would be happy to 
to further exchange our lesson and experience with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sorapong. Uh, now I would really um, appreciate if we can move a little bit uh, quickly on the questions just so we have enough time for our final presenters after this session. Thanks everyone for uh, staying with us and for the uh, really interesting and diverse presentations. So our first question here is for Peter. Uh, what can you say about how sustainable food having the reputation as food for the rich um, and unhealthy processed food uh, being more accessible and affordable to more uh, poorer marginalized consumers? Are there any strategies being explored um, to address this? Well, for the question and um... I think uh, education has to uh, uh, first to to all consumers because uh, uh, sustainable food should should not be limited to uh, to a particular uh, set of consumers, whether rich or or, or poor. And um, um, there can also be um, uh, well, the role of, of of government consumer protection agencies to uh, test uh, products, all products in the marketplace for, for residues to make sure that consumers can, can trust the products they find in the marketplace and, and know that they are not uh, being put at, at risk. And uh, yeah, we know that there's, there's progress uh, globally in, in all, all marketplaces to, to ensure this, despite the cost and effort. Uh, finally, Great, I thanks. would say it's, uh, oh, well, yeah, enough. Okay, sorry to cut you off, sorry. <laughs> um, I think uh, the questions are still in the box in case uh, there's more that you'd like to add in, in writing there. Um, and uh, for Ma'am Alice, one of the questions here is uh, really picking up on the point you made about uh, clustering farmers and the area that, that they manage, uh, the land area that they manage for economies of scale as a social innovation. Uh, could you share with us more about how this was realized in the AMIA village context? Yeah, of course. Uh, what, what we want to target are the climate vulnerable groups. And no normally these are the disadvantaged ones. So we use science. We use uh, the results we've completed with SEAT, the climate risk vulnerability assessments. And we also use the participatory climate risk vulnerability assessments introduced by, by 11RR. So we use this in identifying the communities that need to be addressed. Of course, we wanted to challenge ourselves those uh, extremely vulnerable to climate change. We targeted those. And then we organized the farmers through our regional field offices in partnership with local government units. And the tar target uh, there was for farmers living together or tilling contiguous land of 100 hectares. As I said, adaptation to be effective, it has to be wide scale. So from the start, we started with scale. Uh, second, we allowed the local government units and the farmers to understand climate change and identify their climate risk using uh, the tools introduced and also focus group discussions. After that, uh, with the farmers, the local government units, and the DA regional field offices uh, introduced some innovations or gathered the, the adaptation measures being practiced locally, and then they match it with the identified uh, hazard. From there on, uh, they experimented, the farmers experimented with the technologies, and they chose the most suitable according to their needs. And finally, they also identified what are our needs as support services. So we can continue with these projects and 
that those were the ones that were delivered. Like if the challenge is drought, the Department of Agriculture provided tanks or drip irrigation, and they did this uh, drip irrigation technology, other technologies like uh, vermicomposting, mushroom production, crop livestock integration, and many others. So it was a happy, happy way of of increasing the options available for farmers and then uh, farmers picking out what are the most suitable and appropriate according to their context. Great, thank you very much for that. Sorapong, I'm um, gonna repurpose a question that was asked uh, for, for Julian earlier, but I think this is one that's actually relevant to all of our panelists. And so uh, I'll put it to you a little bit differently. We hear so often about knowledge gaps on uh, different systems that work where, the data of costs and returns, the different risks and basically tailoring um, climate smart agriculture to different contexts. Um, and I think what you have done in Laos is really adapting the climate smart village approach and climate smart agriculture innovations to what's needed. And you're the only one today with a, a, a school food program, for example, and a meals program. So in your perspective, um, is there a benefit to harnessing the uh, CSV approach for contributing to a shared knowledge platform? Um, and if so, uh, what would be uh, some of the, the uh, experiences that would need to be on that platform to share at a more regional level, but still for relevance at the national level. Okay, uh, in my understanding, uh, when we have uh, we generate the, the impacts from the uh, level of level, community level, we might have other uh, uh, step as the collecting the uh, or gathering the lesson from the field and uh, document it all lesson learned and share at start from the local level first. We expect that the local uh, partners, government understand on this, and as well as bringing this up to this level where we can uh, uh, do do more advocacy work or advocacy work with the local uh, ministry, like a ministry of agriculture. We 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 also uh, plan that okay, uh, our lesson will be documented and then share, widely shared in the countries. As far as the region, if we can uh, have a better what we, what I mean the, the, the platform to share that we, we also expect to, to reach that uh, achievement in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you all for your time and answering the questions. Uh, for the final reactor for today's session, let me call on Dr. Drupa Chaudhry, the Chief Scaling Officer a Chief Scaling Operations at the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, ICIMOD. For almost two decades, he has been working among marginalized mountain communities in the Himalayas. He has done significant work in an IFAD funded project in India, managing transformations in shifting cultivating areas. His special areas of interest are managing transformations in shifting cultivation, with special focus on tenurial and access regimes and climate change adaptation and resilience building. Hello, Drupad, and welcome. Thank you, Tiffany, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'll keep my remarks brief. I think, uh, you know, it has been a rich and very informative uh, session from the morning, uh, listening to Julian, listening to uh, the other uh, presentators as well. Um, I would just confine my uh, remarks to how do we bring about scaling? I think there are some basic principles that we adhere to, that we need to adhere to. 
and uh, these are drawn from experiences that we have had of uh, you know adopting the climate smart agriculture and climate smart villages approach in the mountain so although the lessons are from the mountains i'm sure this is applicable in other places as well um andy made a remark which is very important he talked about how uh, you know climate smart whatever you're doing on climate smart villages are actually co-developed and these are approaches which are which evolve based on the knowledge of the farmers and the communities there and with a blending of science um i think that's a very important basic attribute of climate smart, uh, smart villages we have to keep in mind that unlike scientists farmers cannot afford failures if anything fails the farmer is not going to retry that and therefore whatever the farmer has adopted are things which have been tested through generations and it has proved to be successful that's why they pick it up what we need to do is to increase that or to uh, increase the efficiency of it we need to blend in science bring in new technologies and new approaches in there and therefore keep on co-developing those practices second point which is important is the maintenance of diversity um, farmers all over know that if you have diverse uh, crops being grown mixed cropping you have trees and vegetables and other crops you are spreading the risk and when you want to increase resilience risk spreading is another basic criteria that we have got to have now when you keep this in mind and you build on local knowledge skills and practices um what happens is when you're blending with uh, science you're strengthening farmers practices and their ability to deal with stress whether it's climate stress um you know market related but you you're strengthening the capacity of farmers and making them more self reliant once you do that acceptance of all those introduced technologies and their approaches is much higher because what the farmers see is that this is not alien but it's building on their knowledge and their skills therefore it brings about what we term as spontaneous outscaling where it's the spread from one farmer to other a peer learning which is brought in and a peer replication that uh, andy also talked about that's the first step in scaling in outscaling and seeing this then what happens is it's much more easier to build alliances with other stakeholders for example the local governments and this is what alice was uh, uh, referring to you know how local governments can very uh, be very very useful in outscaling the next step is finding champion within those stakeholders uh, and i think again i would uh, you know mention alice look at the enthusiasm that she has the the, the confidence that she has on uh, climate smart agriculture and climate smart villages this is how you have champions within decision makers who can take forward and not just outscale but upscale the whole approach that you have um i think to take things forward there are a few operational aspects which we need to keep in mind and that's joint monitoring together with the program or the project team it is necessary to bring in these stakeholders governments as well as the communities who can then Uh, monitor the progress in a participatory manner have a learning from the field and also share those learnings to improve on approaches which are there finally as julian mentioned capacity building is not the only thing we have to do a number of other uh, you know support activities as well but capacity building is important and the capacity building is not just in terms of technologies that you bring in it is important in terms of converting or helping farmers convert to actors in the value chain as peter talked about 
and also when you're looking at their uh, building their voices for uh, you know negotiating or asking for support from the governments lastly i think uh, one word on the role of the private sector as peter talked about in his presentation there are various ways in which you can strategically build up the private sector uh, relationships and partnerships and also nurture partnerships as uh, co-partners in the uh, in building up the climate uh, smart agriculture thank you very much thank you drupad very much for uh, that enlightening reflection of all of our discussions today that concludes our webinar thank you everyone for all of your questions it's been a very interesting discussion made possible in part by uh, the active participation of our audience. So thank you very much for bringing those uh, challenging questions forward. And uh, we remind you that next week we will have the second part for this two part webinar series. If you haven't registered yet, you may click on the link that our team is posting in the chat box now. Uh, and that will provide us another opportunity to deepen the discussion uh, we had today. Uh, there's still a few questions left in our Q&A box. Our speakers will stay on for an extra 10 minutes to continue answering them in writing. Uh, but that's the end of our webinar. Thank you very much for making your time available. And for those who are attending uh, from the Philippines and have missed your lunch, we uh, wish you a very good lunch. Bon appetit and take care.
Thank you. 